Good evening and welcome to the school committee meeting of April 22nd, 2020. As we start all meetings, I'd like to remind everyone that we are broadcasting this live. We are also recording this for use at a later date if need be. So please keep that in mind. If at any time during this meeting, because we are on Zoom, that you're having any problems, raise your hand so I can kind of see you and we'll try to work our way through it. But we are getting better at it. I'd ask you to please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I Thanks, pledge Michelle. Allegiance to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to, to the Republic, Republic for which, which it stands, stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice, justice for all. all. Okay, again, we're going to have to do a roll call attendance and everybody would be as patient as we can be. We uh, have a little bit of ground to go over. Um, we had a meeting this afternoon and we'll, we'll get into all of that as we're moving forward. I'm going to take attendance. Mr. Boyce. Yeah. Ms. Fires. You're, you're um, muted, Don. Here. Mr. Colody. Yeah. Mr. Howard. Present. Mr. Jones. Here. Mr. O'Brien. Mr. Scriven. Here. Mr. Small. Here. Allie Taylor. Here. And Bob Hayes. Here. We're missing Mr. O'Brien. If Mr. O'Brien checks in, please, um, if I overlook it, let me know. Okay. I will let you and know, Bob. Pardon me? I will let you know if he checks in. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes of February 26, 2020. So, I'm a little yes. small. <laughs> yes, Mr. Colony. Do you have a, do you have a question? No, just motioning. Okay, Mr. Small motioned, Mr. Cullen Second. seconded. Sure. Any discussion? Mr. Boyce? Yes. Dawn? Yes. Dan? Yes. Chris Howard? Yes. Mike Jones? Yes. Robbie O'Brien? Yes. Mr. Scriven. Yes. Fred. Yes. Allie. Yes. Bob. Yes. Thank you. Entertain a motion to accept the minutes of April eighth, two thousand and twenty. Mr. Small makes that motion. Second. 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 Mr. Boyce. <laughs> okay. Did you get that, Michelle? Much better. Much better. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Steve. Yes. Sean. Yes. Ann. Yes. Chris Howard. Yes. Mike Jones. Yes. Rob O'Brien. Chris Scriven. Yes. Fred. Yes. A <clears throat> Excuse me. Allie. Yes. Bob Hayes, yes. Okay, superintendent's report, remote learning and school closure updates. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Uh, before we begin with that, I just want to make everybody aware that today is Administrative Assistance Day, and I think we have the best administrative assistant on the Zoom right now, taking the minutes for her. So I just want to acknowledge Michelle Lindbergh and give her a round <laughs> a little bit for, for all the hard work she's doing. She's working Thank you, Michelle. Right now. Thank you. Good job, Shelly. Thank you. It's a reference to Carmen earlier. If anybody else wants to take the minutes, they can. <laughs> the, uh, uh, since since we've had the uh, COVID crisis in the district, Michelle is really, the all essential office has stepped up, but Michelle is on the clock 24 seven, making sure all the things that I have to get out to the community are done um, promptly and efficiently. So she, she, I, we really appreciate her today. Um, as far as remote close, the, the closure, as you all know, the governor extended the closure out for the duration of the school year. 
the uh, Commissioner of Education is going to make some modifications to um, uh, the remote learning process uh, on Friday. I think Whitman Hanson is, is in a very good spot. Uh, the commissioner is focusing in, or the focus is going to be on power standards, the standards that we think are the most uh, the most important for kids to have this year before they re-enter school in September. So that is the, the rollout on Friday. However, based upon what we've been doing with our leadership team and with our teachers, I think we're in a very good spot. Parents shouldn't expect major changes to our process. Um, the other shout out outside of Michelle is I, I really want to, our teachers have done a, a, a hell of a job. Um, for those of you who are teaching your students at home right now, parents that are listening, and I know some of you on this committee are parents who are working and trying to teach students at home. It's, it's, a, it's a daunting task. Uh, I ran into that situation this morning when I was trying to help my two kids with their online assignments and what they were doing while multitasking doing my job. So I, I want to shout out to all the, the home educators out there that are doing it, but our teachers are doing a great job. And I think our principals supporting them and, and giving direction uh, have done yeoman's work over this over this time frame, and um, we really have a great team in this district, and we have really have a great community, uh, and we're working really hard. So I just wanted to publicly give everybody a pat out from from parents at home, students that are working, to our teachers in the, at, in their virtual classrooms, and our administrative staff have been re have done a, a really good job of this. So again, I don't anticipate major changes to uh, the learning plan going forward. Um, the commissioner has also spelled out and, and, and started to prep us for what summer might look like as far as any type of remediation or any type of extended school year programs for our special ed kids. It might not look the same as what we've had in the past. We might have to do some distancing within the schools. We might have to have kids wear gloves and masks. We don't know. And we don't really know what it's going to look like in the fall. More guidance will follow. Uh, hopefully Massachusetts and the rest of the country will come over the hump or over the curve and flatten it and we can get back to some sense of normalcy once we we enter the classrooms in uh, in September. Uh, George and I have kind of put a, 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 a uh, any type of extracurricular events in the schools over the summer at this point. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen um, again with any type of guidelines that come out from from our DPHs or from the governor's office but Conley Camp and some of those camps that run over the summer, we've kind of put a stop into that at this point because of the cease of the school year. We might have some extended year programs um, or summer programs. We might have some, some uh, building use uh, things over the summer. I know some dance companies have already inquired, but we've ceased all of that at this point because we don't know what the guidelines are going to be. The other hot topic, and I had a conversation with um, we set a meeting up last week for yesterday with the superintendent's council. Uh, and I spoke to the members of the superintendent's council and, and we purposely, I purposely set the, the meeting up for when I knew the commissioner or the, or the governor was going to lay out that school was closed so I could get some of their reactions and, and their thoughts moving forward. And the big topic is graduation and the end of the year um, events uh, or milestone events. And we have not canceled graduation. I, it's not going to happen on the traditional graduation day at this point as school is closed, but we're looking at dates in, in July and August. Um, the later, the better, uh, as we get more guidance on social distancing. Uh, some folks have already sent me more, more than one person. In fact, less than 12 have now sent me ideas on graduation, and we're sending them out to the kids right now to get their ideas on, on what they would like to do. Um, the most important piece that came out of that council meeting was the students really appreciated what the teachers, what the administrators, what the community has done for them during this time. And they just wanted to acknowledge publicly that they appreciate everything and all the good thoughts that, that have gone into uh, making their end of year that has now ceased as they knew it uh, as best they can. And nobody's terminated anything, nobody's canceled anything. We're still trying to be optimistic, although cautiously, of what we can do. Uh, and one of the ideas that they really think is important <clears throat> for closure for the seniors especially, since they can't really say goodbye to their teachers, and it's really not the end of the year, is um, doing a senior drive-by or do a, a couple loops around the around the school in their vehicles and doing a semi-parade. And we'll work with, with our local uh, FDs and PDs to make that happen. 
for them. The other thing that's on our plate that we haven't had discussions yet, as the commissioner just put it out there, is how we're going to retrieve or close school out, how kids are going to retrieve their items in their lockers, in their desks. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a plan yet uh, because we don't have guidance yet. So that'll roll out within the next week or two. Uh, of how we're going to do it. Is it going to be building based? Is it going to be grade level? Is it going to be alphabetical? Who's going to staff it? We haven't had an opportunity to discuss with the leadership team. It's going to roll out, but um, but that is something in place that we know kids are going to have to come in and get their, their gear from their lockers. Uh, elementary kids are going to have to clean out their desks of things that are there. So those are, those are bullet items that we're going to address leadership wise. And I'll share with the committee and the community and the community as as we determine those uh george did i miss anything as far as the closure stuff uh no not at all um as early as tomorrow we have things that we have to discuss as far as students who need their medicines uh we opened up schools for the students who needed their medicines for the short duration up till may 4th so that's one of the topics we'll talk about tomorrow in our leadership and then those long-range plans what do those long-range plans look like for closure and then what are those uh what are the does it look like for opening? Um, the only thing we really, like Jeff said, is the uh, the standards that we're going to address um, when we hear from the commissioner. But I, Jeff did a good job summing up what we learned uh, on a state level and what we've already transpired to our building-based leaders so we can move forward collectively. As of today, we have 37 more days of remote learning. So I'm, I'm seniors usually do the senior countdown, the superintendent's doing the, the virtual countdown right now of 37 more school days till the 15th. Uh, the seniors want to know when they're going to get out. Uh, Dr. Jones and I spoke yesterday that seniors last day will be the traditional last day as on the on the school calendar for them. Um, and, and we'll go from there. Does anyone on, on the committee have any questions as far as the remote learning or the closures at this point? Mr. Small goes up first. He had a question, then Don, then Dan. Fred? Uh, mine was uh, more uh, wanted to make sure that our teachers were acknowledged for the great job that they've been doing, you know, under unknown circumstances. Uh, you stole my thunder on that one, but that's OK. <laughs> I don't think we can say it too much either. Uh, the second thing in having a conversation with one of the members of our board of selectmen here in Whitman uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, just talking about frustrations and, geez, we got to really try and do something for these seniors. You know, geez, what about a parade? Uh, lo and behold, he mentioned it last night at uh, the selectmen's meeting, and it was received nicely. Uh, so, you know, that's just something to toss into the mix. Maybe the towns do something as well as uh, the school district to acknowledge, you know, what these kids are actually missing. Uh, you know, it's just a darn shame you know, that it's happening. Can I add right on to that, Fred, before we go to the next? Sure. So. So one of the things we also, Dr. Jones and I talked about when this first happened, um, I know that when Mr. Hayes speaks at our commencement um, for our senior class, he always says, you know, once a Panther, you're always a Panther. And one of the things that Dr. Jones and I also talked about was after our commencement, when we have our, our seniors class of 2020 graduate from high school, we might hold another event if possible for the class of 2020 Who's, gotten in, who's getting an associate's degree, who's getting a bachelor's degree, who graduated from Whitman Hanson and acknowledge them publicly because they've all left their commencements from their college, colleges and universities as well. So we're looking at recognizing our, our, our graduate alumni who have now since lost their next commencement and mm -hmm. are hurting Great just idea. like our, our seniors. So, so we're planning that. The challenge for that is we don't have a timeline uh, because of this virus. So, but that's in the works as well. It's not going to be hand in hand with our high school graduation. But if we still have a formal graduation, we'll keep the setup for the next day. We'll keep all the flowers. We'll keep the entire setup so we can acknowledge um, our, our, our graduates who are post grad, so to speak, graduating from, from a, a tech school, from a trade school, from, uh, from a, a, a community college, or from their four year degree because they've missed that as well. And I've had a couple of alumni reach out and say they're, they've missed a senior year as well from their institution. So we want to keep that in mind. And I think that adage of once a panther, always a panther, if we can do something for them as well, uh, we're going to work, work through that. Not, mm -hmm. not to take away from our senior class this year, but something additional. Yeah, great idea, I think. Great idea. John. 
Thanks, Jeff. I like that idea too, because they were all class of 2020, no matter where they graduated from. So I like that. Absolutely. Um, and I think to um, follow Fred, I can't say enough as a parent of a high school and middle school student. Thank you to the teachers. Thank you. I heard from Mrs. Horton from the office. I've heard from many people um, reaching out. So thank you. Um, no change anticipated with the learning plan, as you've said. Um, question I had from a parent around middle school grading. Can you just confirm right now um, it has been a sort of a credit, no credit, and, and we're getting the message middle school wise. It's it's optional. And I know in the beginning it was, you know, take care of yourself and so forth. But is there any reinforcement as we do have 37 more days sort of to give those students who um, want to continue? I mean, do you get what I'm saying? You know, can we yeah, uh, so reinforce some of the learning? Yeah. It's, it's still credit, no credit. I think the grading issue is challenging, especially yeah. with the, the demographic and, and trying to keep equity. However, there is an expectation that middle school students are, are doing something academic two and a half hours a day. Okay. You know, so okay. It, it, the expectation is three hours in high school, two, two and a half hours in middle school, and two, uh, two to two and a half hours in elementary school a day. So I know teachers are giving out assignments and, and for a teacher to jump through a screen and say, you know, I'm demanding you do that. That's becoming a challenge, and that's where we want some parent engagement from that. And if parents are, are saying their kids are, and I think a 13-year-old middle school boy is probably going to say, hey, I'm done for the year. But we're going to try to engage them the best way we can and keep some learning going so that they, they, don't, uh, they don't remediate. The, the conversation I had with my, my fourth grade daughter who didn't want to do anything was, well, we're going to have to just make it up in tutoring over summer school. So, you know, we have to do things now if you don't want to do it. She bought right into that. So it, it's if, if the parents are having issues with their kids connecting and they're not saying, I'm concerned with the teacher giving uh, instruct not not instruction but stuff for them to do. If the kid's not putting it back, the teacher's going to reach out. The counselor in the middle school is going to reach out. The assistant principal will then reach out. But if parents need help with that engagement, uh, we can also help. So contacting the the Mr. Grable or Mr. Tranter or, or Mr. Belvis or Miss Sandler would be would be my best my best advice and, and direction. Okay, right, because the comment um, was specific, a certain email, um, I guess the student had read it and the word optional was there. So the parent had to then, you know, talk, well, optional, but you yep. still uh, need to, so thank you for the yeah, reminder of the two and a half it, hours. There's an expectation of, of learning and that's coming from the commissioner. We didn't modify his direction and that's an expectation from us. So, you know, so if, if Kids are having trouble engaging, and I can see I can see it's a challenge. You know, yeah. luckily the weather hasn't been good, but it come May, middle of May, when it's 95 degrees outside, and, I, and, the, and Joey's supposed to do two hours of work, it's going to be a challenge. And this is a challenge for all of us. So if, if parents need help with their engagement of their children, uh, let let the building administrator know, and we'll we'll try to go from there. It's also important our, our, we are reaching out if we don't hear back from kids uh, if they're not engaging at all. We are working with local PDs to do wellness checks to make sure people are okay uh, because it, it did come across my desk that we do still have quite a few hungry families out there, uh, families that don't have transportation, um, that can't access our food pantries, and, and our food services is, is continuing their delivery. So things might have changed in the households. Mom and dad might be out of work and, and finances have become a problem. Uh, I still ask folks to reach out to me and I'll connect them with our food services people. Um, to, to get them as much uh, uh, breakfast and lunch that we can. Thank you. That was going to be my last question. Um, are we reaching all students? And yeah, are we checking in on those who we don't want anyone to fall through the cracks? That's important. So I think, thank you. I, I think that's the shout out that I gave to the building administrators. Anytime they can't, if, uh, if they've fought, felt a child is not connecting, uh, either through the teacher, the counselor, or them, they're actually letting George and I know. And right now there's there's just a slim few and we've actually had to get DCF involved just to make sure everything was okay. Thank you. Dan, thank I, you, Don. Okay, I just wanted to find out because we're the possibility that this could go on into the fall maybe. Um, have we heard anything about like for our IT, like to handle this, like from the state? Are they going to be able to make sure we, we can have all our students participate, adding wireless access points possibly? Um, 
additional Chromebooks that we can't, you know, we don't have, but we need to supply for these students to learn and maybe, you know, expanding our infrastructure to handle it better. Uh, so, 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 go ahead, George. Jump so in. what's taking place right now is that a survey has gone out to every administration of every town in the district from um, the Department of Ed. Um, this is talking about those very same things that you're um, saying, Dan. Uh, the second thing is that the federal government is in the process of trying to release a stimulus package for those, um, we'll call them COVID, COVID issues that, that we would need to do, and it would be hopefully available um, mid-May. Some of those things they have told us so far, we have not seen any parameters, but they had told us so far that you would be able to qualify for these funds, run it through like we do every other grant, and the things would be very wide ranging. And the words they used specifically were not only cleaning, but technology in order to support. So we are trying to make sure that we're doing those things. Um, and there should be, if we qualify and if we're available for it, uh, some of the funds coming in to try to make sure that all students have the connectivity that they need. Uh, we're still getting reports. We have over 400 and I believe 80 Chromebooks that are out now. Um, we have stopped that except in very specific cases, um, but there's a process that they have to go through now just for the health and safety of all of our people. And um, But we are finding that if there is a need and there is contact, we are still doing our best to make sure that we can get them what we need um, for what we have. The question you're raising is what happens when we lose what we have? There is some word and there is some funding that we may be available for um, from the federal government. There's also a governor's package that's coming out um, federally, but will impact our governor also so that we, we may be able to qualify for additional funds there. The specifics aren't out, only the big picture of it is now. You good, Dan? Um, yeah, because you already answered the retrieval of kids and teachers' property, so that was handled yeah. earlier. Um, but for yeah. this, and, and once we figure that out, we'll 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 roll that out. But we want to be cautious about right now. Uh, if you're watching the news, which everybody is, we're right in the in the middle of it, so we're being very cautious and and letting the committee know, letting the public know that I have barely anybody in the buildings now. We all our secretaries are home. Um, the phone is going to voicemail. They're retrieving the voicemail, but nobody is in the offices answering the phones. It's it's rare that Michelle, Michelle went in for a few minutes today to get some documents. We're still making sure everything we have to sign, we do. But building-based, there's really no one in the buildings at this point for the health and safety of all of our employees. Technology is, is working virtually. That's why we've stopped the distribution of the Chromebooks. We did three major distributions. Now it's a case by case. We just don't want to endanger any of our employees to this virus. As everyone here knows, uh, we have employees that have had this and are, are, are fighting it right now. Um, nobody's been hospitalized, thank, thankfully. Uh, but it's the word I hear is it's, it, 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 it's a beast. Um, and we don't want to infect any of our staff if we don't have to. So we've taken every precaution. We're following the governor's guidelines of working from home if we need to. Um, and essentially, if, if I go in to sign a document, uh, if, if the business department is in, John is in there, because it is still business as usual, bills have to be paid, payroll has to go. But everybody's using the precautions that, that we've laid out and that the governor's laid out. Circling back to when we talk about Panther Nation, we do have people in both towns that are struggling, that are out of work. Both food pantries have been in contact with us. And they are having a, a, de a desperate need for services bigger than they've ever had. So if anyone watching the school committee meeting from Panther Nation or to do with Panther Nation, keep in one, one thing in mind. You can stop by the Hanson Food Pantry and donate money, and they have the opportunity to buy food at a discount rate from um, the Pine Street. I, I think it's called the uh, Boston Food Bank. Also in Whitman, the La Matinas led by their eighth grade student are uh, selling signs that say Whitman Strong with a big heart on them for $15. $10 of that goes directly to the food pantry. They've already sold over 400 signs. It's an unbelievable fundraiser. The Whitman KFC, I believe, is handling some of the sales. The La Matinas are delivering them. They delivered some to me today. 
If you need a sign, I'm at 808 Bedford Street in Whitman. <laughs> I would be more than happy to accommodate you, you with one, 10, 30. They're $15 a piece, and it's helping feed Panther Nation and many other people in the towns of Whitman and Hanson that are struggling during this very difficult time. So kudos to everybody who's pulling the wagon to keep everybody safe and to keep everybody fed. So anybody that wants to donate, the, like I said, the Whitman Food Pantry or the Hanson Food Pantry on High Street, get at it because we're, we're doing the best we can and everybody in town's doing an unbelievable job. Imagine an eighth grade student getting this idea, putting these signs together. She sold 450 of them or so, so far. It's unbelievable. Mm. Kudos to her. Great, great job. So anything else before we move on to director of business? Jeff, go ahead. Thanks. So um, I'm going to ask to pass over. We, I'm not putting forth a, a finalist candidate today, um, but I just wanted to, uh, to talk to the committee a little bit about the importance of this position. Uh, and the process that we've had so far, um, as you know, the the John Tuffy has been has been doing a, a heck of a job filling in part time. Um, the absence of a business director has has been difficult in our central office. Um, as a full time employee, as as our other folks have tried to support that absent uh, full time position. Uh, when we posted this position, we had eleven applicants. Uh, three of which were certified as business managers. Um, I don't think it, there's there's anything in our in our um, policy that says specifically that we need to have a certified candidate. However, there is a DESE certification for business manager, um, and I think it's important that we have one. So we had three certified candidates. Uh, one person took a position, and we interviewed the other two. We're still vetting. Uh, those candidates, but I think it's important that I know we we survived, uh, and I call it surviving without a full time person. But it's really not uh, not having somebody has prohibited both George and I from putting forth um, some of our 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 time in areas that we should be putting our time in. Uh, and I'm finding out as I talk to other superintendents what a business manager actually does or a business director does. And, and something crucial that we haven't had for, for a few years is somebody that's going to provide a vision for the finances for the district, uh, looking at enrollment projections, looking at decreases of enrollment, and then helping the superintendent kind of plan out financially what our financial picture is going to be if we were to be normal. Take away COVID-19 and, and the revenue thing, but what would a normal budget look like in, in fiscal 23, 24, 25, 26? And that would actually help us uh, plan. That hasn't happened, and because you know, I think John is 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 the right person for that. But he's part time and he's retired, and I, I don't have the vision that, that he wants to stay uh, as a full time person. And he's I'm not watching him on this on this video, but he's probably shaking his head right now. No, um, but I think it's important that we have someone who's qualified for the position. And I just want to remind the committee, I, I was hired as the principal in in, in 2010. And at that point, we had two assistant superintendents in, in central office. We had a director of, of technology and an assistant director of technology, and we had two accounts payable people in, in central office. We have one assistant superintendent. We don't have a director of technology. We don't have an assistant director of technology, and we we, we did not replace a person who retired in central office. Um, and we're functioning right now with a part-time business manager in, in John Tuffy. So it's essential that we get the right candidates for this position. Um, and if, if we will present the, the candidate that we feel it, it will, will fit our, our team, uh, when the time comes, but I know that we're looking at a, a tough budget cycle and we're looking for things outside the box to potentially save some revenues or save some things in our budget. But this is a position that I think you know, we really need to, to hit it out of the park, um, for our team, for our district. And, and, and I will also let you know the candidate pool out there is less than a puddle. It's raindrops. Um, so we will do our best to bring forth a candidate um, that we think will fit us as a, as a community and us as a central office. Uh, currently, there is no one in district that is looking for this position. Uh, we've asked uh, a few of our, our folks upstairs if they'd be interested in becoming certified, and they're not interested in, in that or, or for that right now, either because of they're getting close to retirement or that's not the avenue that they want to go. Um, 
So we will keep you up to date when we can get a candidate for you to interview. But I also want to explain this process. This isn't my hire. Uh, we will vet that person. George, myself, and John will vet that person, present the candidate. But you're, feel, you're free to ask as many questions of the candidate. This is a school committee appointment. Um, this is your hire. So for whenever we present that, and I think I, we have members on the team that, that uh, on this committee that weren't there when, when our past business manager was hired. So I just wanted to give you that uh, update that it, it's your hire, it's your selection process, and um, it's a majority majority vote to put that person in, in the position. So, John, if you were listening to that uh, <laughs> message from the superintendent, I'm changing the locks on the building so you can't leave. So bring a sleeping bag because we're keeping you. It's pretty quiet thank there, you right? For what, thank you for what you do. Yeah, John. John has done a great job. I, I, he's helped. He's not only, and, and we're going to keep him on board. I think he doesn't know, but he's going to work probably through August now. But, uh, uh, but he's been a mentor to both George and myself, and uh, because of his experience as a business manager and as a superintendent, but he's a man of character and what we he's putting us in a, in a good position, even in this fiscal downplay, he's had us, he, he keeps us calm. So I want to thank him as well. Um, publicly again. Any questions? I'm sliding back and forth. Make sure no one's got the hand up. Okay. Fred does. Regional, Fred just regional amendment. Agreement Amendment Bob. Committee report. We just got out of that meeting. Mr. Small, I'm sorry. Go ahead. One quick question. Uh, so the candidate that we were bringing forward is now out of contention? I, I didn't say that. I just said I wasn't presenting him today. I just was looking for that clarification. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Okay. Regional Agreement Amendment Committee report. Jeff and Chris and so we were just on, and I'll, I'll shoot this over to Chris Scriven as the chair of the Regional Agreement Committee. Uh, briefly, uh, last week we met, we met again today at four o'clock at the last meeting. Um, the committee asked me to contact uh, Mass Association of Regional Schools, Mac Reed and Steve Hemmen. Um, uh, got a lit, we gathered some questions. Michelle worked through the holiday on Monday to gather questions. They send out to Mac and, and, and Steve I think we sent more than 40 questions to them uh, and they put together a presentation today to answer those questions to the regional agreement committee. And Mr. Scriven, if you want to add to that. I didn't get the very last part, but um, I would only say if you didn't, Jeff, that we uh, add a couple of members to our committee. That's true. Yes. Yep. Um, just to be, just to comply with uh, the official vote that we took in the school committee, just a little oversight. Um, so Frank, Bynum, and um, I'm sorry, I forget the other gentleman's name from Hanson. Ken McCormick. Ken McCormick was added to the committee. Um, and uh, we agreed to hold off on our objectives until um, we meet again next week. And that'll give time for uh, some of the members to ask some additional questions um, to Mars. But that, I just want to thank them publicly. They did a great job, really clarified a lot of our, our questions. So I appreciate that. Well, again, it, the, the meeting wasn't real lengthy, but I want to thank all the members that were there on the Zoom to try and, you know, everybody's trying to come to a conclusion and they're all working very hard. So Don was first and then Mr. Howard. Go ahead, Don. A question you mentioned, Ken McCormick, what is his role from Hanson? He's I don't, a, I'm not. Familiar. He's a finance committee member from Hanson. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Chris, you, actually, I'm sorry. Sorry, Chris. Is it possible you can run down what the makeup of that committee is just to refresh on all the members, just for people who are listening? I can do that. Yeah. So uh, the members are myself, Chris Howard, Frank Lynham, Justin Evans. Um, I'll, Frank's a Whitman Town Administrator. Justin is a Whitman Board of Selectmen. Rick Anderson, Whitman Finance Committee uh, Chair. Uh, Chris George, uh, community member at large from Whitman. Matthew Dyer, um, a selectman um, from Hanson. Laura Kemet, um, she's the, uh, I believe she, Laura's the chair, right? From yeah, chair the selectman. selectman yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so Ken McCormick um, from um, Hanson Finance Committee. And Bruce Young is the Hanson 
the community member at large. Non-voting members uh, are Jeff Simonak, George Farrow, uh, John Stanbrook, who's a town administrator from Hanson, and Bob Hayes. Keep going, Don. They have two. So Justin Evans is one board of selectmen from Whitman and two Hanson board of selectmen. The representation is equal. We, we the way it was worded in our um, vote um, approved by the school committee was uh, it was up to them whether it was a selectman or town administrator. So they, they for example, the okay, Hanson town administrator is not a voting member. Understood. Okay, thank you. Tony, either or, yep. Chris, okay. and then Fred. Yeah, Jay, Don. Yeah. Yes. Chris. The only thing I wanted to add, just a couple things that I think would be helpful for the committee um, in, from today's conversation uh, a little while ago was a uh, good conversation with Mars. Uh, one of the things they clarified, I think, at least what I heard today, was the utilization of the agreement that we uh, previously amended as kind of being the base model. So I think that'll require a, kind of a, a deeper dive in terms of making sure that we're amending that uh, as a group for then subsequent presentation back to the school committee. Uh, and then there were a couple of data points that, that I thought were interesting that came out of the questions. I think they were shared with the school committee as a whole. Um, one was, uh, it would, I think it's the last bullet on the document that was sent by Michelle earlier. Um, one item was uh, what they said was moving from an enrollment-based assessment to the statutory assessment method is a rare situation that has been resolved in a couple of districts with a phased in readjustment of the assessments over a five or six year period. So that was just a data point um, from their experience that they threw out. The other thing that they said, um, which was interesting, there was some, some conversation and discussion around uh, what the school committee had voted in terms of the assessment methodology. Uh, and in their opinion, what they suggested as part of that was that um, because no action had been taken and specifically the budget had not been certified, that uh, in their opinion, the assessment methodology could, could be changed. So um, those are just a couple things that they threw out there. Um, I think we got a lot of work to do, but I just wanted to at least make sure the committee was aware of a couple of those data points. Mr. Small, then Mr. Boyce. I just want to, uh, Mr. Scriven, uh, I am uh, the alternate member from Whitman. Uh, school committee on the on the uh, committee, and you failed to mention that once again. So, just want to bring that to your attention. My apologies, Fred. No problem, Mr. Boyce. So, uh, the um, thirty questions that came from Jeff today are they going to be supplied with written answers? Well, um, and and on, what I had planned on doing, Steve, to not not to interrupt you, but yeah. I was going to ask Michelle if she would print those for the committee and print the answers that Maz gave to those questions okay. so that all 10 of us have that in our next packet because I'm going to be asking you to meet again next week. I think there's going to be some other discussions that the school committee has to make as we move forward as far as um, different stuff to do with employment and that Jeff had discussed. So okay. Well, that, one more question. Point, go ahead, Steve, it. keep going. I just wanted to clarify, Michelle sent those, I think it's 622 tonight. So you, if you haven't gotten them yet, I think the oh, entire school okay. That's right. All right. Yeah. And my, my other question had to do with Chris Howard was saying um, we could be looking at something different. So what is that? Do we know? What are we, what are we referring to? I what think Chris, about? I can't speak for him, but I think Chris is just talking about the questions and some of the answers that came forward. Okay. If that answers you, unless Chris, can you answer that in more de more definite than? Yeah. So Steve, I don't know which part about the which agreement we're using or the two uh, data points. Yeah, for for basically for which agreement. So uh, um, I know you said something that you know what Mars or, or whomever hadn't seen something like this, but I think before that you were saying that we as a committee would have to make a probably have to make a, a decision on either modifying or, alt or doing something different. Yeah, so let me clarify that. So um, yeah. in, in my mind, what I was trying to figure out going into this was were we using the existing 1991 agreement mm -hmm. or were we using the agreement that the school committee had essentially voted, approved, that went to both towns and never passed? And, and what right. uh, 
Mars suggested was using the agreements that had been amended and modified, approved by the school committee previously, and that had gone to both towns and not passed as kind of our base model. So that's that. Oh, gotcha. Okay. We're gonna and I know Don, Don referenced that at the last meeting. So thank you. That's that's start that's working from there. Over. I think is what I heard today. Okay. Thank Chris? you. Chris. Uh, Chris. Correct Driven. me if I'm wrong, but um, the agreement you so mentioned you're gonna... referring to was uh, preliminarily approved by uh, by Desi. Right. Thank you. Okay. Dawn and Fred. Dawn? I, I, I was able to listen to, um, I think, the first half of that meeting. I, I do recall the Mars representatives also acknowledging our agreement from 1991, more or less became invalid at 1993 with Education Reform Act. And I appreciate, I did hear the phase in part about five to six years and changing from a per pupil to statutory um, is unusual. But I think the, uh, we should recognize the understanding is probably that that phase in should have, would have come back in 1993. Um, that's really, they were trying to send a message that agreement um, from what I heard was not, is not valid or has not been valid um, with that method. So maybe this is for discussion after everyone's had a chance to hear the meeting in full and, and review all the notes. Um, but I wanted to bring up what I did here as far as that. Well, Don, what, what I'd like to do, and Michelle can hear me, we're going to Fred and then we're going to Chris, um, is I, we're going to print all that for the committee so they can review it as, as the amendment committee moves forward. Thank you. Fred, then Chris. You know, is my interpretation, just as uh, someone listening, that the 91 regional agreement uh, is not a valid document. Uh, but they also did say that one part of an agreement that is invalid does not mean the entire agreement is invalid. Uh, so it's sort of the pick and choose. Uh, they made reference to statutory, the statutory method needing to be referenced in any uh, agreement as we go forward, uh, so to speak. I mean, there's a lot to cover, you know, throughout that meeting you know, as far as that goes. But from what I could gather and what I understood was the statutory method uh, would be referenced in any new agreement and has to be referenced in any new agreement, even with an alternative method stated. Uh, but our 1991 agreement is no longer, quote unquote, valid. Uh, and I think that was using uh, their words, maybe paraphrasing slightly. So that's Chris? Yeah, so I'll I'll um, I'll I'll clearly say that I did not hear Mar say that our agreement was invalid. So I know Jeff, Chris, Bob, you guys were in that meeting too. They they did not say that. They may have said uh, there was a section uh, that education reform superseded, but they clearly said, and it's in the written documents that the just because there's a section of the agreement that's invalid, it does not invalidate the entire agreement. I think that's just important for the folks listening. We we have a valid regional agreement. Chris, I believe the words were um, some of the uh, sections of the uh, 91 agreement weren't in compliance. And that's what we were working towards to uh, when we formed the first regional agreement committee to, to uh, be in compliance. Yeah, I, I believe that's what I heard too. Fred? And uh, forgive me if I didn't articulate it clearly. What I was trying to articulate was that the agreement from 1991 is not a completely valid agreement. There are portions of it, and that I made mention, you know, that they said one portion does not completely, you know, disavow the entire agreement. Uh, so if I didn't articulate that clearly, I want to apologize. That wasn't my intent. I think we're all saying the same thing. We're just, we're, we're picking at it a little bit. And again, I want to thank everybody for taking their time this afternoon. I know that, uh, these Zoom meetings are not real, real easy to do, and we're all we're all getting through it. So thank you all. Anything else about the regional agreement committee report? I will have it printed and presented to you, emailed, so you can look it over and, and see what Mars clearly had to say. And again, thanks to Steve Hemming and Mac Reed for spending their time with us this afternoon. They they very very valid points. Anyone else?
I'm looking on the other page, no hands up. Okay, 2021 budget and local assessment. I'm gonna to read to you a question that was asked to Christine Lynch of the Department of Education and then I'll read to you what her answer was. Hello, Ms. Lynch. I know we spoke previously and you were extremely healthy, helpful. I mean, unfortunately, as you're aware, we're still having issues with our regional district assessment. It seems as if we are heading towards a 112 budget. My question is this, when or if that happens due to the change in methodology to the statutory method, the town of Whitman's contribution would drop from FY20. I understand that we cannot pay less than the previous year, so would we receive our under the assessment under the 112 and be obligated to pay the difference to make up payments equal to last year's? ultimately giving the district slightly more than one twelfth level funded budget from the previous year. Just looking for some guidance. I hope this was not too confusing. Thank you very much. Respectfully, Randy LaMatina, Selectman. And I'm very happy that he asked that question of her. And here is her answer. Unfortunately, many, if not most, regional school districts will be under a one twelfth budget this year. The department will be issuing guidelines soon to help districts as well as member towns navigate this process. Under a 112 budget process, the commissioner will set an interim budget for a district that generally is not less than the previous fiscal year's FY20 budget. However, member assessments would change from the previous fiscal year due, for example, to changes in minimal, minimum local contributions, enrollment shares, and potential increases or decreases in state aid or other general fund revenues. Assessments may be calculated from the same total budget as FY20, but will not be based on updated FY21 factors as noted above. Therefore, if the calculation of your assessment for FY21 based on updated factors results in a decrease from the previous year, you would not be expected to pay the same amount as you did in FY20. Likewise, however, if your assessment increases over FY20 based on FY21 factors, you would be expected to pay the increased amount. I am including the superintendent on this email as you have asked a good question and it is important that everyone has the same information on this issue. The guidelines once issued hopefully will explain this process more fully. Please let me know, however, if you have any additional questions. Chris Lynch. Now, as we heard today, there's going to be some guidance coming out on this possibly Friday morning about this very subject. I think, Jeff, you and I heard that pretty loud and clear, and anybody that was listening to Matt Reed and Steve Hemming heard the mm -hmm. same thing. They're going to be talking about this on Friday. So I know that the budget and the local assessment, Jeff's going to get into that. But keep in mind, I'd like to have a meeting next Wednesday because I'm not trying to keep you guys in meetings every week, but this budget information is coming different daily. And we, I know you, I keep putting my phone up so I can read. And it keeps blocking, <laughs> you know, I keep blocking the camera. I'm looking at my bald head saying I can't even see myself. But anyway, this is changing rather quickly. So... I would ask that you bear, your, bear with me and we have a meeting again next week. Jeff, would you like to take over about the budget? So, so yeah, the we still need to get a budget out of committee um, at some point. The, the challenge for that right now too, as, as Bob said, we're getting guidance with, with, with the new, with COVID and the fact that town meetings are moving around. Uh, there was supposed to be, uh, a conference call on regional districts today at noon. Uh, John Tuffy, George, and I were in the waiting room for about 25 minutes, and they moved that meeting till next Monday. Uh, I'm waiting to hear guidance on how uh, a 112 budget will look for regional schools uh, on Friday. I'm looking for some guidance there. Um, but people have uh, the superintendent's listserv. Every meeting that we've had with anybody in, from Jay Sullivan. The bill, I forgot his last name from Desi, the CFO, has said it looks like districts are going to be in a 112 budget because of the lateness or the or the fact that some some districts or some towns aren't going to have town meetings until June or even July if they can have them. 
So they, they've talked about the preparation of a 112. Um, the one thing I, I, I will tell you, uh, because of the closure and because of the, 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 the finality of it yesterday, uh, I will be gathering numbers for this committee um, with, uh, with John uh, from facilities, from athletics. We won't have a spring season this year. Uh, we work with the association to give an honorarium to our varsity coaches that have already worked with their teams. Um, some folks have asked, well, what have they done if they haven't had a season? Our coaches are, at least at the varsity level, have kept the kids engaged uh, to, to work out or through things virtually so that they've had something to be to have an opportunity or, or be optimistic about. Uh, they're also going to, these varsity coaches are going to pick up the pieces, but we will see some savings in athletics this year. We will see some savings in, in, in um, cleaning from SJ. We will see some savings in utilities. We just don't know those savings yet because we kind of had, you know, May, May 4th as a, as a target date of our, of our return. So at our next meeting, hopefully, uh, if, if we're having another meeting next week, uh, um, John and I will be able to get you some figures on some of the, the revenues we might be able to recover because of this crisis. The other thing I heard uh, from Chair Hayes uh, through Ms. Kemet, uh, through Josh Cutler this weekend, is that there might be some federal monies for us uh, in, any, in, in any expenditures we've had due to COVID. So I would say our deep cleaning that we were estimating at $100,000 would be a dollar figure that I'd send to the Fed as part of this. Anything we might have to restock as far as PPE, because we've given out PPE uh, that we've had to recover. Anything that we could say is COVID related, uh, anything uh, that we can tie into some sort of recovery that we've had to expend because of the virus, I would tack on to that federal federal uh, dollar amount or that federal grant. I don't know when that's going to come through. And and I think Mr. O'Brien was on it last 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 meeting. He said he'd help out with any type of federal grant for recovery, but he's like, don't anticipate the money for, you know, it's not going to be a check in the mail on July 1. It could take some time. Um, but if we do have monies that we can recover, um, because of COVID, I would ask the committee once we have that dollar amount and once we can finalize it to put it in E and D, and if we could uh, to offset any 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 depreciations in revenues we might have from the state. The only thing I will say is I'm also I have a bill, and I mentioned this to the committee. Once we stopped tuitioning for pre-K and for kindergarten, we have a deficit. I have my now that we've finalized uh, the school year. I have my business folks running numbers with the with the actual cost um, that that we will be deficient because of lack of tuition. Um, so there's a lot of moving pieces in the FY20 budget right now. There there is going to be a, a not, I'm not going to deficit, but we're not going to the revolving account for full day and for pre-K uh, are going to be at a, def, a deficiency. However, we will have not we won't have the expenditures potentially. For some SJ services, um, for athletics, uh, for some transportation and other costs that we might not have to uh, to spend money on. The other piece that we negotiated through North River Collaborative last week is um, North River is going to furlough their van drivers now for the duration of the school year. We will see a 50% um, revenue. Uh, 50. We will see a. a, a we're, they're only going to charge us 50%. I'm looking for the words. They're only going to charge us 50% uh, of our sped transportation from April 27th through the duration of the year. So we will see a cost savings on um, our sped transportation, at least using the North River Collaborative. Um, John or George, do you want to jump in on any deficit or revenues that you see that I missed? Before you move on, I'm getting a text. Um... Jeff, both of those, the, the COVID-19 funding could be coming both from state and local and federal. Josh Cutt was working very hard at the state level trying to make it happen. And the federal government is also talking about it. I just wanted to clarify that, you know, that's going on. And Josh has been uh, supporting legislation and bringing things forward and pushing it. And so, uh, so has Allison Sullivan. And um, a, a state senator from Brockton, Mr. Brady, they're all working hard for our school districts. 
Thank you. George and, and John, do you want to chime in? On anything? Yeah, this is John. Um, some conversations have also started with the Department of Revenue, which is the other state agency that we care a lot about, um, about what they're looking for and, and what sorts of things that we'll be able to do. Some of it would be helpful. There's talk that we'll be able to create a receivable if we know that we're going to be getting funding from FEMA that, that would mean that we would not have to um, lose all of our E&D, uh, that, that they would allow us to create a receivable that they felt comfortable with. There's also talk about uh, allowing us to amortize some expenses. If it looks like it's going to be particularly burdensome, they let us do those sorts of things in 2015 after the winter. And then finally, the discussion that's going back and forth seems to focus on will will the grant programs that we see look a lot like what we saw in 2009 after the after the market crash, where an awful lot of federal money wound up being being targeted but funneled through the state. So it was federal money funded through the state, which is the way we get the bulk of our grants, um, but targeted for schools. So we wouldn't be competing with cities and towns or, or other entities. But all of that is is weeks, if not months, away from, from final action. I also have, Fred, I'll get to you in a second. There's another communication from Department of Education and Secondary Education and Mass Association of Regional School Committees. I'm not sure if everyone got this email or not, but I'll read it so the people can understand it. Mars is continuing to work closely with DESE to provide guidance and information that will assist superintendents and districts in navigating the FY21 budget process. As we know, many municipalities may not have had the opportunity to hold town meetings because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Without approval of the FY21 budget and assessments prior to June 30th, 2020, DESE will be required by statute to set a 112 budget. Operating with a 112 budget is an unfamiliar process for many districts. In order to prepare for this reality, you will be receiving an email with an attached document from DESE by Friday. That outlines the process of setting and implementing a 112 budget, meaning this Friday, this coming Friday. Please review the DESE guidance document. Mars will serve as a clearinghouse for your questions and or comments. Mars will communicate with DESE in preparation for a tentative save the date and time Zoom call on Monday, April 28th, noon to one. So there is going to be a Zoom call from DESE and Mars on Monday, the 28th, noon to one. DESE will follow up with invitations to participate in this call. So that's just, an, I'm not sure if everyone received that email. I know I've been receiving some stuff and I'm pretty sure the committee has, but I just wanted the, the, the people listening to this to know that they are very sensitive of what Mars and DESE, which is the Mass Association of Regional School Committees and Department of Education and Secondary Education, that other districts and lots of districts are going to be having the same issue. Fred, I'm sorry. I didn't oh, mean to no jump problem. in front of you. Uh, you know, a couple of things. One, uh, John, it's my understanding from the folks I've spoken to exactly the way the money is going to funnel down from the federal government to the state government and then from the state to be distributing. And we're fortunate that we do have some champions up on Beacon Hill that do fight for us. So that's a good thing. Uh, have we looked at any of our line items to see if there's some savings rolling over, uh, you know, maybe sub lines, uh, you know, anything well, Fred, else that we're not spending on? Yes, we're gonna look at everything now that it's official as of yesterday. Okay. Uh, so we will have some savings. I just don't have those dollar figures now. That, that being said, okay, um, no. that being said, you know, once we set a budget, the rollover items, we can we can pull money away from that that budget that we set. So if we if we can roll over three hundred thousand, and I'm just using three hundred thousand, and my deficit is one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in pre K and K, I would ask the committee to either put that forth in E and D to use for the FY twenty one budget. $150,000 that we could take off the budget that I presented. So there will be, there will be some rollovers. It, it, it'll depend on how the committee wants to use those rollovers, either putting it into E and D 
uh, and then appropriating it for the FY21 budget or keeping it in, in, in E&D. Uh, but I don't have those numbers today. As of, you know, we have some projections. We had some projections from, from uh, March 13th to May 4th. Uh, and now it'll be March 14th, March 13th through June 15th. Um, and I can, I'll have those numbers. Pretty sure I'll have some solid numbers uh, with some project. You froze. Jeff, I lost you. Uh, well, while he's finishing his thought, maybe Mr. Tuffy can answer this question. Uh, do we know what percentage uh, we used, assuming for uh, reimbursement for regional transportation in the FY21 budget? Same amount as last year, which was in the 80s. Now, it seems unlikely that we're going to see that kind of money next year. Given so we're going to take a hit. I'm, I'm guessing we're going to see around 70% if we're lucky. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't hazard a guess, but I don't think we're going to see the amount we have now. I mean, I think we're all hoping that um, when, the, when the, we finally see a budget, which do the next week or so, that will be the House budget, although supposedly it's going to be a combination of House and Senate together, and a serious budget, we'll get a sense of what that's going to look like. Yeah, we're, from what I've been hearing, they're talking about even delaying that till September uh, for, uh, you know, maybe we'll have bits and pieces, but uh, delaying everything until September for a vote until they can get some revenue forecasts in. Well, it's, 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 we're almost going back to the old days where we used to see an, um, an early a local aid resolution so that cities and towns could um, at least have a number to work with. And then it was well into the legislative year that they finally passed a final budget. And, and uh, that may be the best we can hope for. Okay. Thank you. A local, a local aid resolution. And, and so we know what we have to deal with. John. Thanks. Jeff, you, you mentioned, yes, Jeff, you mentioned the North River um, special ed transportation um, not happening, right? Is that, yes. um, so does that mean these students are um, not engaged with that school? So the, would there be a tuition savings realized with, or are they working still? They're working still. Their tuitions, the teachers in North River are still working, just like our teachers are working. We just don't have to transport them. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and then sort of to piggyback on that, paras that may have been one-on-one -on -one in the district, um, are they still supporting students um, as best they can remotely? Are we utilizing those paras still? Um, yeah. Do you want to answer that, George? You, I saw you shake your head. Yeah. So our paraprofessionals are still working with the groups that they support. Uh, and all of our paraprofessionals have now undergone uh, professional development training. So we're, we're, if they're not directly working with their teachers on a daily basis, they have um, benchmarks that they have to hit um, every pay period in order to continue. And we're using this time in order to get them better for the students that they're in the populations that they work with in the hopes that they'll re-engage with them shortly. Okay. Thank you. Um... I think I had another question, but go on. That's fine. Go ahead, Dawn. Go ahead. Um, maybe it was just around um, any other roles in the school that aren't directly related to student support roles or, um, I don't know, maybe cafeteria workers, but they're probably still all hands on deck with meals. Um, just so, so, so cafeteria workers, it's a revolving account. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with the district account. However, um, we made a decision uh, actually yesterday and, and cafeteria workers are going to be furloughed as of uh, Monday um, because we can't support that in the revolving account since we're not taking in any money from lunches. Uh, we do have a, a staff on in play for um, still feeding our kids, uh, but the other workers are, will be receiving a letter from me. Okay. Anyone else? Jeff, do you have any? Chris, go ahead. No, Chris, Chris Howard. 
Yeah, so um, you cut out and I'll turn it back over to you, but you, this will kind of help. So um, I think you guys hit on a couple of points in terms of potentially some reimbursements that are coming in um, as a result of COVID and starting to quantify some of the operational expense savings as a result of getting the news yesterday. So completely understand, you know, I'm sure you've had some other things going on in the last 24 hours rather than just quantifying all those, those costs. Um, but if you could quantify some of, uh, get us a sense of those costs and some of those reimbursements, I think that would, at least for me, be very helpful in trying to understand how we could look at that in terms of kind of setting that budget mark in a manner that hopefully is responsible at the same time, maybe we have to revisit some of the other things that have been tossed out as well um, and things that we can do. But you cut out on, you think you're going to have that information by, and that's where you Next cut Wednesday. It'll okay. be, it should be by next Wednesday. Thank uh, you. We'll work on that now. I mean, we already, I, I brought all my material home last week from, from my office to start sketching it out because I had an idea that the governor was going to, you know, postpone school or close school as we know it uh, for the rest of the year. So. So I started playing with around some, some, some numbers around athletics. I don't have a number as far as utilities, but we should have those, those figures, at least a solid estimate um, to base our, our, our numbers on next Wednesday. Dawn, go ahead. I'm sorry, one, I remembered my other thought. We should think about the five, what is it, 450, 500 Chromebooks that have been loaned out. When those get returned, we may have increased technology costs, repairs, replacement, right? Just a budgetary item to think about. Correct. Okay. Not only repairs and replacement, Don, but we're going to have to clean them. <laughs> right. You know, that's, that's, I mean, it yeah. doesn't sound like much, but it's, right. the, the cleanliness of these buildings is all going to come into play before September. I mean. It, there's a lot of moving pieces that are changing as we're talking. In fact, just from last Wednesday, look at look at what's changed until today. I know that superintendent had some budget comparisons and we're talking budget. What's the committee's pleasure? Uh, we're going to have a committee meeting next Wednesday. As you heard Friday, there's going to be some new information from Maz and Desi about this 112 budget issue. What's your pleasure? I mean, we, we had, uh, we started out last week with a FY21 required budget of 55,040,238. And with the four teachers, it's 55,320,238. I know that there was some questions as to the comparisons for the FY21 and the FY20 budget. And in your packet, or if you're doing it electronically, you can probably see what the changes were um, in that budget. I'll get to you in a second, Fred. Um, so would you like to go over that, Jeff? Because the committee is going to have to make a decision on what's going right. on. And I know this has been happening and we've been non-voting it and voting it all different types of ways. And it seems like more information is coming out daily. I'm not trying to push this off, but it, there is so definitely some new, new information. So the numbers are the got, numbers. Um, Fred and Fred. you, Chris. So I was just going to say, you can take questions. The numbers are the numbers as they are. Um, I, with, with the closing of school, um, and I hate to say I want to add, but with the closing of school, if we have larger class sizes next year and kids need remediation because they've lost academic time, Putting 27 or 28 kids in a class is not going to be beneficial for any of us. That being said, I'm struggling because I don't know what revenues are going to be like. But I wanted to, for, from the educational aspect of it, our kids have, although we're remediating, there's going to be a need for certain students to have some extra attention. And if I have a class size of 27 in second grade at Indian Head, Duval, or Conley, uh, we're going to struggle. George, I saw you. George, you're up, and then Fred, the, and then Chris. The only other thing I'd like to add on that teacher perspective and cuts and everything is that now with COVID-19, one of the things that the commissioner did say to start thinking about long-range plans is, what if you're six feet apart, every desk is six feet apart in a classroom? So if 
I use my experience at Whip Middle. They have trapezoid tables. Um, if you now go to 30 students, but you have to be six feet apart, um, you're not you're going to outlive the space of your of your physical classroom. So those things are also going to play a role with higher class size also as we move forward. I only bring it up because it was on a list serve today with a number of assistant superintendents that everyone in the state is starting to struggle with. What if you don't put the teacher in front of all the kids as we begin? What that what might that look like? So I throw that out there. That's all. Fred and then Chris Riven and then Dan Colody. Fred. Uh, a couple things. Uh, number one, uh, can you lead us through what a one twelfth budget might look like? I know we've talked about it again uh, in the past, but just to reiterate how many bodies and what we would be looking at uh, on a one twelfth based upon an FY20 budget. So it'd be our, our our budget, and and I'm guessing depending upon where where our employees come from, whether it be parents, teachers, administrators, what have you, it's between 35 and and and, and 37 pe people. But because of unemployment, we're going to have to jack that number up to 47 or 48. Does that sound correct, George and, and John? Yes. So we we're looking at devastation. We're looking at 40 plus kids in the class. If you could even, oh, yeah. pick them. Uh, I, I don't know what I mean. We're going to do our best at the elementary level, uh, but I think the secondary piece we're going to have to look hard. If we lose 47 people in this district, we lost 19.5 last year, um, and we're able we have class sizes double that. Um, and and we're going to have class size issues across the board, we're not going to have any supplies. Um, I, I 48 people is a lot. That's, okay. You know, and, and, and coming on, off of com, coming off of a time frame where kids haven't been in a classroom since March, um, that's a tremendous effect on student learning in this district. And based upon the information that you gave us uh, earlier, or just now, the additional teachers, uh, or the four additional teachers, I think, as uh, we've been discussing, is that considered to be required at this point I, in I, time? And or it would be in lieu of something different that you would juggle the budget numbers and the priority based, levels. Based on where we're at right now, I'd say that it's it's, it's a priority um, because I think the the, the 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 fact that we've been out of school and we're going to have a need for for more attention for certain learners, those who have, as Miss Byer said today, have been disengaged potentially or because mom and dad are now out of work and they haven't been able to help them at home, the lower the class size, the better. So I would, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic we will we'll be able to get those people in this budget cycle. Um, so I would move those people up or those positions up into that required piece. They're as essential for us right now as the technology people that, that we've moved up there. My fear for next year is that if we do have a resurgence, I'm going to need as much tech support as I possibly can. We were very thin this year, and if we're out at another for another piece of time next year, or even a couple of weeks where we have to supply kids with more technology, I need those support systems in place. So, Mr. Small, yeah, I think at this point, because of the the, the fact that we're out of school and we can't even get an assessment um, of where kids are at. In a classroom before before next year, those those class sizes are definitely um, the lower the better that we the lower the better. Now, would that come ahead of say? I know we have a curriculum piece that we had been doing without in the priorities. In my opinion, we haven't had a curriculum since two thousand one, and we're going to ask. Yeah, we've prioritized that, and I think we've worked hard to get that curriculum. So I, I, everything that is in required, I don't want to start pulling things out of that, um, out of that budget until the town says we, we have to, to pull it out. Everything that we put in required is essential for next year. Chris Riven, and then Dan, and then Don. Well, I was just responding to your <clears throat> question about the pleasure of the committee in regards to what, what to do with, with the budget. 
um, at this point. And I don't, I think it's um, best if we hold off and get as much information as we can um, to, to make, you know, to put forth a budget that um, we believe in and not just, you know, I think it, it, the, the more we educate ourselves, the better. And, and it's just my opinion on it. Ian? Yeah. Um, I know it's some people's minds and it's the uncertainty with the towns can and cannot afford. Um, looking at how the state revenues are going to be down, we're going to be taking a hit anyways, but we, we're, we're charged with setting a budget to present to the town, whether they pass that budget or not is not up to us. We are just to take what we believe the children of this this region need in, re in the requirements that the superintendent and his team has put forth and um, try our best to get that budget passed. Um, the way things are going now, you know, we have to go on that realistically. We're gonna take a hit. We're going to lose money, but that's not up to us to decide here. Our decision is to make sure these students get the funding to properly educate them. We know times are going to be tough and things are going to change. It's, it's a moving wheel. It's, it's New England. It's like the weather. It's going to change. We know that for a fact. I mean, we don't even know when they're going to be allowed back into the schools. That could drag on. We're hearing that could possibly drag on to the fall because people don't stay home and follow the rules. Um, we're at the peak of the pandemic. So basically, you know, our, our job is to set a budget. Waiting around to find numbers is not going to happen. It's changing every day. All we're doing is kicking the can down the road. Set a budget, bring it to the towns, let them work on it. They can have their say. Then if it gets rejected, it comes back to us. We work on it. But we can't keep letting folks be dangled on a string by not setting a budget. Jeff has to know what we're going to try to go for because he has to notify people if they're going to be laid off. So by pushing this down another week or two does no good for these towns. It's just, you know, we're, we're going to hit the inevitable anyways, but we should be coming up with a budget that's supposed to be our charge to make sure that these kids are being educated, whether the towns can pay for it or not, that's up to a town meeting, which is still to be seen sometime down the road. And like I said, if it gets rejected at a town meeting, it comes back to us. That's when we have to go back to Jeff and say, listen, you know, you're going to make more cuts. Do you think we can, you know, do from that point? But to keep putting it off, it's doing us no good. Jeff has to know. His administration has to know to move forward. Um, we don't want to wait till like May to tell them, you know, halfway through May. That's unfair to people that are employed by this district. Um, they have the they, they have the right to know, and it's you know contractually we got to be telling them at a certain point, you know, postponing because we don't know what's going to happen. You know, we can sit here till September doing this. The whole thing's going to come down to we go to a one twelve budget because we can't even get an agreement going by then. Um, that fiscal year 2020 budget going into the school system, like Jeff said, you're going to have 40, 50 kids to a classroom. You know, and we don't even know what the mandate is. Like they're saying, the possibility you have to be six feet apart. Um, we can't just keep sitting around, set the budgets, let it go to the towns. They can go back and say that's unrealistic, whatever. But, you know, if we don't give them something in stone, they don't have to work on it. And, you know, like we've been saying for weeks, we we it's, we just have to get this done and get it going. We we have major hurdles ahead of us, and that can be brought up after we find out what goes on with this budget. But I think we should be voting on a budget, setting the budget, and giving it up to the towns like we're we're supposed to. Um, waiting another few four or five weeks, it's not, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to change anything, but take more money out. So we can set it because we can always go down. We just can't go back up. People got to remember that. We can bring it down if we have to. We just can't go back up. So let's give them what they need and then work on it going forward. Because that can happen all the way up to the town meeting, as we've heard before. Uh, I said my piece. Thanks. It's Dawn and then you, Mike. Go ahead, Dawn. 
I believe the budget can be moved up. Is that correct? It can go down or it can go up? Uh, Chair Hayes? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I'd like to move to set the budget at $55,320,238. That would include the four additional teachers that Jeff requires. Mr. Boyce second. Mr. Boyce second. Discussion, Mr. Jones, you're next. Then go ahead, Mr. Jones. Yeah, we have a second. We're going to go into discussion, but whatever you wanted to say. Yeah, go ahead. My question was it was before that, but uh, Jeff, can you explain why, in layman terms, and maybe John could also, the one twelfth budget? Why does that include cuts? Why is that instantly a cut? Like we, I understand it's like we keep saying it's forty four teachers or whatever, but if it was a one twelfth budget, why instantly would it would these cuts take place? And can you just explain that? Sure, Mike, because because they're going to use fiscal 20 numbers. They're not going to if it was uh, I could if if this committee approved fiscal 21 budget and the commissioner gave me a, a one twelfth of fiscal 21, we wouldn't have to cut anybody. But they're going to use last year's numbers. And right now, uh, last year's numbers, uh, we go went up. What percentage, John, or, or what was I'm looking in my documents right now? We're, we're short. We'd be short two point something million dollars. Using fiscal point numbers, two point six, two point six million dollars. So that's why, if they give us an FY twenty budget, July one, uh, we have to keep to no <clears throat> salary, um, that, and, and we're short. So that would be the cut. That's why it's important to to try to get. If the commissioner comes out on Friday and says it'd be a one twelfth of your FY twenty one numbers. I, I wouldn't be as nervous about that. But a 12th of, of 2020, uh, if we don't have a budget by September, I'm short 40 plus people. Chris, Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Mike, were you finished? I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, Chris Howard, then Don. So I agree with what some of Dan said, specifically our to make sure we're looking after as best we can the students of this district. I think the concern has been all along, and it goes back to kind of this change in the assessment methodology that we bounced around at nauseum, is if, if we continue down the path of simply saying, this is it, there is no middle ground, take it or leave it, as an elected representative from Hanson, I can tell you what's gonna happen. And, and I'm fairly certain we're gonna end up at the exact 112th place that we're trying to avoid. So to sit here and say, well, let's just set a number and set a budget today, thinking that that's actually going to meaningfully determine and protect the kids of this district, uh, I completely disagree. And I think that's the issue. Um, I would even go so far at this point, based upon some of the discussions that we've had with some of the folks from Whitman, that I'd like to, I'd like to have on uh, next week's agenda, depending on what the budget happens, uh, vote happens today, I'd like for us to actually have an agenda item that rescinds uh, the assessment methodology vote. And I'd like for us to look at change that to give um, an opportunity to the town officials of Hanson to come up with a compromise, because that has not happened up to this point. Um, clearly, what's happening on the Whitman side is it's a take it or leave it. And if we do a take it or leave it, it is going to decimate the students of this district. Dawn, then Fred, I saw you. Go ahead, Dawn. I believe that setting this budget does meaningfully protect our students because what it does, it tells Commissioner Riley that we believe in what our students need. We know what they need, we know what our teachers need, and that's what we're voting for. If we don't vote for anything, then we are at a detriment because we may go to 112th of FY20, but I still don't believe because I know earlier in this meeting it was said that you, that Commissioner Riley could set 112th of FY20 or set an interim budget. Interim budget. I heard that, interim budget, which could be any amount. And it's also in the, the, the law that says, or other amount as deemed by the commissioner. So we know where we stand in relation to other districts and other towns and funding schools. I don't believe that the commissioner of education is gonna come in and hurt these students 
or set every single town in the state of Massachusetts at 112 of last year. He knows that makes cuts. He knows that hurts every single school. So by voting for what we believe in our students need, that's what we're doing. Mr. Boyce. What? And then Mr. Small and then Mr. Colony. I didn't have my hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Small. <laughs> That's okay. I um, thought you were waving at me, Mr. Boyce. Yeah, you know, with all due respect, I don't see a path that we don't end up at a 120th if we decimate our budget, which I can't vote for in good conscience to shave off our budget uh, to what the administration says is absolutely the bare bones bottom required. Uh, and we've had years in the town of Whitman. You know, we took $850,000 out of one-time capital funds in order to fund a school budget a few years ago. We did it because it was the right thing to do and it still didn't meet the complete needs of the district, but it was what Whitman was able to reach up and do at that point in time. And we've taken money from free cash. Okay, and that was a year that I sat on that committee and we had members from your town, you know, saying, well, we need 12%. You know, that's what we need to set the assessment at. And I believe it was voted on at one point in time for that. And, you know, we have to provide an education to the students. And I firmly believe based upon the new information from the superintendent, the changing times, you know, the 53 million and changes of budget is the bare bones of what these kids need. And to do anything else for us as a school committee to set it forward would not be a responsible act. Let's give the towns the number. Let's hope and pray that they will somehow figure something out. But if we're going to, you know, turn around and decimate our budget, that's wrong. And that's not fair to the kids. That's my piece. Dan Cully, then Mike Jones again. Yeah, I just, I just wanted, my, uh, Chris, I, I'm not saying it's, it's, you know, this is it and it, it can't change. I'm saying we have to give them something. And like we've been saying, we shouldn't be taking things away from the kids. We got to throw it at the towns to see what the towns say. We understand Hanson's most likely going to say no way because, you know, the way it changed and it puts a heavy burden on the town of Hanson. But as a committee, I'm an elected official too. As a committee, we have to put forth that to the towns to vote on it, whether they can do it or not, or at least give it to the FinCons to say, you know, yeah, it can be done or there's no way in hell it's going to be done. But we can't just keep taking away from this school system. We have to set set the goal and you know give them what we think the children of the the, the region need. Um, do I think both towns are going to pass it? Probably not. But that's not up to us. We have to tell them this is what's needed. Just like what Don was saying, if it comes down to the 112, they're going to 2020 unless he thinks we have the gumption to say no. This is what we want for our kids, and then he can set that. I mean, to, to look at it the way just to say, well, they're not going to or we're looking for a compromise. That's not our charge to look for compromises. That's up to the towns, not the school committee. As a town, as a taxpayer, you can say that. But as a school committee member, you're not supposed to take that and say, we're looking for a compromise. That won't happen this fiscal year. There's been no movement from Whitman, unfortunately, for you guys. You know, I, I understand. I, believe me, I, I know what you're going through. You know, I, I, I do think maybe there should have been a phase-in period, but nobody ever brought that up when it was voted on. So we're, we're at a point right now, we have to set a budget, give it to the towns, and see what happens with the towns. Most likely they're going to reject it one way or the other, one town or both towns. But we have to set it for the best for the students of both towns, this region, and we have to, you know, we, we just got to go and get it in there and see what happens. Then if it's denied, it's, it's brought back to us again to discuss. At that point, then we really have to take on, a, you know, a big role of what's going to happen to the future of the school district. You know, it, we just can't be bringing it down any further than it already is. The kids are already getting a royal beating on that anyways. 
We have financial troubles in both towns. It's going to be a heavy hit on Hanson. I understand that. But we have to at least bring it to the towns. It, 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 it isn't like this is it. You know, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm saying we have to give them something. If they, you know, don't swing at it and they just say, no, nope, we're sending it back, they're sending it back. I don't want it to sound like we're, we're dictating what's going to happen. We're just setting a budget, which we believe the children of these towns need. And if the towns don't go for that, that's really, you know, that comes back to us. Then we work on it from then. I mean, but we also have to look at that possibility that one twelfth, if, if there is a possibility they're going to 2020, but they might do something in between. I'll take that any day. We go to 20, we go back to the budget year of 2020. Um, these kids get nothing anymore. They're not going to get taught. It's it's going to be ridiculous. And even back in the days when I was in another regional school district and you had double sets because you had problems in there just to really, re, you know, be able to have classes because you couldn't fit everybody into one area. Um, we don't want to look forward to that anymore. I mean, we, we got to keep our kids to what they need. Um, if the towns don't want to support that, shame on them then. Uh, okay, Mike, that's then Chris, to... Scriven, and then we're going to move to the vote. Unless anyone has something different. Mike, Jones? No, I'm all set. Thank you. You're Allie good? Taylor needs to speak, Bob. Allie I'm needs sorry. To speak. Allie, uh, right after Chris Scriven. Yep. Go ahead, Chris. So, Dan, a couple of things I disagree with. Um, first of all, I see myself as a, a member of the school committee and, and my charge is to do everything and I, I can in my power to advocate for and to ensure that our school district is supported um, as much as possibly as, as we can be by the, the, the town. So um, I will we'll continue to do everything in my power to see that that happens. Secondly, you mentioned that no one uh, suggested a phase in approach. Um, I specifically remember a phase in approach being discussed um, initially, um, and then I sat in a regional uh, agreement committee um, when the selectmen of both towns were present, uh, uh, two selectmen from both towns were present. Um, the Jim Hickey from Hanson looked across the table at the Whitman selectmen and said, you're basically asking me to trust you, correct? Because we were talking about going to a statutory method. And that was the understanding. There really not has not been a, a concerted effort um, from Whitman, I don't feel, uh, in, in good faith to this point to, to come up with a compromise. And that's just the reality. Thank you, Bob. Allie Taylor. I'm sorry I didn't see you, Allie. Go ahead. Allie, unmute. I'm sorry. It took me a minute. <laughs> um, Rachel's not here to help me. <laughs> um, I can understand Hanson's predicament and their position what where, where they are um but to basically what what i'm hearing is that you all don't want to vote on a budget until you hear that there's a compromise and while to a certain degree i can understand that that's not our job we i don't care how they're gonna pay for it how they're gonna divvy it up our job as everybody has said is to take care of the kids and vote a budget that we need not keep pushing this down the street until we hear whether there's going to be a compromise or, you know, whether Hanson is going to have to pay what they're going to have to pay and so on and so forth that we shouldn't be holding up a voting on a budget for that. You were voted to have the best interests interests of the students in mind, do what needs to be done for our students, our staff in the school district. Second comes the town in Texas and so on and so forth. We need to vote a budget. We cannot keep kicking this down. That's all. Okay, is there anyone else before uh, we move to the vote? Fred, anything new? Go ahead. Yes. Uh, you know, looking at this whole situation and that Desi is issuing guidelines next uh, because quite frankly, I think if we vote it right now, it doesn't pass with a seven uh, member majority anyway. We're probably better off to get as much information as we can in order to take a step forward. 
Uh, I think that might be prudent of our committee right now to get that information. I mean, we have a motion and a second, and all in favor, you can move for move to a vote. I'm going to move to the vote real soon. You know, where we have uh, some other things happening and some more guidance. You know, perhaps uh, that might be a situation or might be a method to uh, utilize. As far as changing the methodology, we voted the method based upon what was requested by uh, one of the Hanson Board of Selectmen. That was what came out of that. Was, it, it's in the minutes, Chris. It's in the minutes. Uh, that was my interpretation. They wanted a method. But even, even if the method is changed, That's not true. Okay, it doesn't, uh, you know, quote unquote, change anything. You know, it's still things get kicked one way or the other. You know, it's just a question of which town kicks it, so to speak. Oh, but if it does okay. go to one twelfth, it's statutory, no matter what. So. And I think it's completely irresponsible of us if we don't vote a budget. Sorry, I spoke out of turn. Okay, we're at the. I have a motion of fifty-five million three hundred and twenty thousand two hundred and sixty-eight dollars. Now, in your packet, or whether you received it electronically, we do have a budget comparison. If you would like to hear what the two thousand and twenty budget is versus the two thousand and twenty-one budget, and how much percentage of change. There is, or I will move right to the vote. Would you like to hear that? Move to the vote. Just move to the vote. Okay. I have, again, a motion of $55,320,238. I have a motion in a second. Mr. Boyce, yes or no? Yes. <laughs> yes. Dawn? Yes. Dan? Yes. Chris? Howard, Chris Howard. Chris Howard, no. Mike Jones. No. Rob O'Brien, absent still? Okay. Chris Riven. No. Fred Small. Yes. Allie Taylor. Yes. Bob Hayes, no. Five, four. Would anyone like to make any other recommendations on a budget number? Um, I will read to you the comparisons before we go into any other version of a budget number. 2020 benefits and insurance was $8,446,821. 2021 is 8,805, 821. That's the $359,000 change in the plus, which equates to 4.3% change. Debt and interest. In 2020, it was $890,983. In 21, it was 927,519. It's a $36,536 increase, equates to a 4.1%. Facilities, in 2020, it was $1,950,384. In 21, it's budgeted at $2,004,384. It's a $54,000 change or 2.8%. Legal, budgeted 90,000, budgeted in 2021, 90,000. It's a zero change, zero percent in increase. Supplies and services in 2020, it was $2,871,058. In 2021, it's $3,129,968. That's a $258,910 increase, or 9%, it equates to. Salaries in 2020 were $28,962,886. In 2021, 
$311,394, a $1,348,508 increase, equating to a 4.7% change. Tuitions, in 2020, it was $5,268,000. $745. In 2021, the budgeted number was $5,457,290, a $188,545 increase, equating to 3.6%. Utilities budgeted in 2020, $1,383,000, budgeted in 21. 1,435,000, a $52,000 increase, equating to a 3.8%. Transportation, 2020 was $2,561,861. In 2021, it was $2,878,861, equating to a $317,000 change or a 12.4% increase. The total numbers, 2020 budget, was $52,425,738. In 2021, budgeted $55,040,237, a 5.0% increase, equating to $2,614,000. $499. Jeff, thank you. Well, whoever put it up there, I just see it came up. I wondered how the sheet changed. Fred, then uh, Mr. Boyce. Quick question. Uh, on the transportation line, the $2,561,861, uh, a 12.4% increase. The majority of that I'm taking is special ed? That's correct. Oh, okay. Uh, I just want to clarify that. Because I think the uh, contractual budget went up either two and a half or three percent, if I'm not mistaken, with first student and the balance. It, the, the first student increase was two and a half percent or forty thousand dollars in total. Okay. Great. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. You are the man with the numbers. Mr. Boyce, Some, your hand up. Yeah, was um, somebody asking for this specifically? Because I know. We've been often asked for a lot of numbers. Um, well, I mean, it was nice to see, but was there someone, I mean, just name a name who some, someone said, you know, we need this or whatever. Dawn. Dawn, it was Dawn? Well, I had somebody ask me and uh, it was actually Justin Evans at the Board of Selectmen and Whitman um, wanted to okay. recognize the budget and in pieces that could be related to the town's budget. That being said, just our salary percent increases and then other expenses that the district has that are like general government expenses on the municipality side. So the retirement, the health insurance, they have uh, maintenance, utilities and so forth. So just to see those percent increases year to year. That answer your question, Mr. Boyce. Don, I wasn't. Yeah, well, it's just good to know who your hand up. I know you wanted to answer him. Fred. Uh, just for clarification under salaries, uh, that's not strictly salaries. That's also steps and lanes and other uh, contractual incentives. Correct. That's the total Correct. amount. Yeah. That's the total amount we would spend on employee compensation. It does include. Um, a hundred and eighty thousand dollars in in positions for I think it, I think they're all in technology and some additional costs related to um, um, English as a second language learners um, but the rest is is related to steps lanes cost of living cost of living uh, what about uh, educational reimbursements is that lumped into that line as well that is not lumped into that line item. It, it's strictly W. It's it's strictly what would be reported as W two income. I'd like to make a motion, Mr. Hayes. Yes, go ahead, Fred. Uh, to set the uh, the uh, FY twenty one budget at fifty five million forty thousand two hundred thirty seven dollars. 
Mr. Boyce seconds. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Discussion. Fred, could you say that number one more time for me, please? Uh, 55, 55 million, million 40,000. 40, 238. 237. Okay, I'm sorry, Fred. It is a dollar <laughs> cheaper. Um, Must have been that water you saved us on. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I thought you said. Hey, I have my own. Me too. <laughs> Okay, so I have a motion and a second for $55,040,237. Discussion. Don, that is also just, the number before you go, Don, bless the four teachers, just so the people listening will know. Right, right. We just heard how important it will be in the fall when students return to have smaller class sizes. And this budget does not provide that. This budget keeps higher class sizes. Um, that's where I stand. Yes, Fred. Uh, and while I recognize that, and obviously by my vote a few moments ago, I agree with you, Don. Unfortunately, we don't have a past budget at that. I'm trying to simply do whatever we can for a past budget and hope and pray somehow with some of the reimbursements that we get that the superintendent's going to be able to address those needs. Um, but we need to get a budget done. Go ahead, Don. I hear you, Mr. Small, but I can't vote for something that I would then have to explain to a commissioner or a representative that may come into DESE and say, why did you vote for this? Um, they may ask. Tell us about your, why are you at an impasse? What is the challenge here? And I am going to say that I'm putting our students first and our teachers first, and I'm meeting our district goals of class sizes. 20 students in a K to third grade class. I'm not saying it's the right thing to do, but it might be the only thing we can do. And it may have to end up coming down low, depending upon where revenues come in. That's the scary part. Anyone else before we move to the vote? I don't want to miss anybody. I'm just scrabbing back and forth because I can't see everyone's hand. Mike, you good? Okay, so I have a motion and a second. The motion is $55,040,237. And it was seconded. Mr. Boyce. Yes. Don Byers. No. Ian Colody. Yes. Chris Howard. No. Mike Jones. No. Robbie O'Brien, absent. Chris Scriven. No. Nope. Fred Small. Yes. yes. Allie Taylor. Yes. Bob Hayes, no. Five, five no, four years. Mr. Hayes. Does, does anyone have anything else to talk about with the budget or any other number they would like to propose, whether it be greater or, or less or? Mr. Hayes, I just have a question. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to, Allie? Yep. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. At the risk of sounding rude, is there any number that Hanson would vote for at this moment in time? Because I'm getting the impression that regardless of the number, it's always going to be a no vote until you guys hear something different about a compromise. Would, would anyone like to uh, address that? From Hanson, that was directed to the Hanson members. Yeah, I'll say yes. You're, you're right, Ellie. There, there, there is no number right now until Whitman makes, Whitman makes the deal with our selectmen. We're not going to vote yes. Well, forgive me for being rude, but I think that it's extremely irresponsible. That's your we opinion. We need to set a number. It is. is the, We're going to go to a 112th budget unless you guys 
No, you're, you're going to vote. So, you're going to vote. You're going to vote in a budget that Hanson's going to refuse in years and years down the road. It's going to have negative effects on our district. We're looking at the bigger picture. How are you looking at the bigger picture, Michael? Explain that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute, Mr. Boyce. I appreciate you jumping in, but Chris, go ahead. Chris Allen. So again, I'll, I'll restate what I said earlier. I'd like to have the assessment methodology put on next week's agenda. And so then, Allie, the question comes right back to you and the folks in Whitman, right? So is it a question of the budget or is it the assessment methodology? Because I keep hearing it's, it has nothing to do with the assessment methodology. We need to pass the budget. So we'll, I think we should have that discussion next week. Mr. Boyce. Mr. Boyce, then Allie, then Don. I'm all set. You sure, Steve? Yeah. Allie, Taylor? I am just getting really frustrated with this committee. I can completely understand Hanson's position, but this is extremely irresponsible. And I am really losing my patience with this committee. We need to set a dang budget. The towns can't get anywhere unless we set a budget. Give them a number. Dawn? Dawn? I, I would ask Chair Hayes, Mr. Jones, Mr. Howard, Mr. O'Brien, you were all members on the committee during the original agreement discussion two years ago, started in 2017, three years ago now. You voted in favor of that regional agreement. The language in that is no different than what's presented before us right now in regards to statutory method. So I'm wondering what's different today that you didn't understand or you didn't know when you voted in favor of that regional agreement as a school committee. Mr. Small. I'll answer on behalf of the Hanson folks and being a Whitman member who this terminology does benefit. Uh, this was stuck in by Mars. I don't know that anybody uh, had any discussion of that methodology when we were meeting, et cetera. Uh, you know, so I'll, if it wasn't crystal clear apparent to them, you know, I could see why. Anyone else? I have one follow up. Go question. ahead, John. I was Chair just scrolling Hayes. back and forth. I didn't see you. Go ahead. Thanks, Go Chair ahead. Hayes. Then I'm hearing that you're waiting, Hanson is waiting for a compromise from Whitman or a deal to be made. What's to say that when you are handed that deal and you are satisfied with that, that Whitman will be satisfied on the other side as well? I don't know what any deal is going to be and what the terms are going to be. So, Okay, I, I don't know that you you know you're we're all left anticipating. Oh, we have to wait until Hanson is happy until they're they're satisfied. But why? Where is the compassion? Where is the understanding on the Whitman from Hanson to Whitman over the numbers that have been paid in the past when statutory wasn't realized? Although the district was telling Desi that we were using statutory, so. Help me understand what the deal is that you're waiting for so that maybe the six Whitman com committee members can know that deal as well and further discussion from there. Chris? Shriven, I'm sorry. Ron, could you repeat? I didn't hear all of your first part of your, your comment there. Could you repeat that, please? Uh, the first part of my comment. You would, Hanson's you would waiting asking, for a deal, you said. The regional agreement part where I discussed where this committee and Hanson members had been had approved the regional agreement back in 2017 that went before the town meetings. This school committee and those members that are still on this committee, they saw that regional agreement that had statutory method in it. It the committee approved it and it went to town meeting. So the, uh, it's my confusion now that certain committee members are against that same language today 
that they did previously approve two years ago with that amended regional agreement. Is that the comment, Mr. Scriven? I guess, I guess so. I, I think it's I, I think it's important to re, reiterate the point that all you know we if anyone was aware, it was a very small minority of people that knew about statutory. I know you can talk about the finance committee uh, handbook and I, I get it, I understand, but I'm trying to make the best decision for our school district based on what we know now and move forward. And I don't wanna make a decision in a vacuum. I wanna do what's in best interest um, of, of our school district in, in, in the long term. Um, so that, you know, and yeah, I guess that's how I how I feel. Thank you, Chris. I would. Yeah, so Don, um, I think I think Fred and Chris hit it on the head. I don't think anyone had a full understanding of um, what was happening the last time through. And I would point to the and, fact, uh, and I would point to the fact is that everyone did. Then Whitman probably would have voted to approve the agreement after Hanson had voted to approve the agreement and then subsequently rescinded it. So to me, it's pretty clear no one had an understanding of of what was going on with the changes in methodology. To answer your question in terms of what is it, what does a compromise look like? Uh, what I proposed to the regional agreement uh, committee in the first meeting was a 50-50 split this year. Take the statutory methodology, take the agreement methodology, sum the two together, sum the two together and divide by two. Dan and then Chris, Chris Scriven, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. I mean, um, I'll reply to when that vote was taken, we, most of us, I think, were all under the assumption that we were doing statutory. So when it's in that agreement saying we're going to be doing statutory, we we're on the assumption that's the way we've always been doing it because that's what we're told. Um, that was a miscruise to us. That's probably why it got by the committee. It went over to hands and they voted it on their town floor till it got brought up that it wasn't statutory that we were using. We we're using the methodology all along. That's when it became a spawn. Number two, we have to stop going into the past and only look to the future. What has happened has happened. There's nothing we can do to change that. Yes, Whitman may have been paid a lot more than they should have, but you know, school committee, selectmen, FinCom, nobody noticed this to two years ago. So you can't go back and say, Whitman should have been getting a lot more money in the past. We're here now, the fiscal 2020 going forward. That's what we look at now. We can't keep going to the back saying, Whitman pay a lion's share of their deal. Number two, you know, I, I do agree with Chris Maybe there should have been a, um, another oversight for us, some way of brought, brought up to us saying, do a five-year plan, a three-year plan, like, a, you know, you know, like I said, 50, 50, 70, 30, then bang, you're done. Whatever it happens to do. Maybe that's what has to be done, but we have with people we have to stop looking back at what happened it's obviously everybody was under the assumption we we're doing statutory so you know we're going to say yeah that's what we're doing until we're told no we've been doing methodology not statutory i think that's what most of the that. confusion was when we passed and then brought to the town of hansen and town of hansen voted for it in october when we came to our may meeting um, between October and May, that's when it was brought up that no, we were doing uh, methodology, not statutory. So, and there's other questions on the agreement. So, Whitman never passed it. If Whitman passed it, there'd be no talking right now. It would have been approved, done deal, gone to the state, boom, done. But we didn't pass it. It allowed them to look into it. They backed out of it. Obviously, good reason. But we have to move forward, people. Compromise or not, it's not up to us. We're not going to do the compromise. That's up to the towns to work together. We're like the third town. We just have to come up with an agreement. Here's what we have to do. You know, maybe they, yeah. I mean, this is one of the reasons why I once said, don't trust them doing it. This is why the school committee should have done something a year ago. Because they can't get kicked down the road. We have to do it our own. We could have brought up the subject of, let's do a compromise and bring it to the town. Bring it to the selectmen. Bring them on board to meet with us. Nobody's done that. And maybe that's what they're looking for. Maybe that's what they have to do. But I mean, I heard on that last regional agreement, not the one today, the last meeting, certain people saying, well, no, that's it. It's wrong. You know, it shouldn't be done that way because there are circumstances where you face it in. You can't just drop a load of whatever to one town to the other and say here, you know, because we paid more in the past. We didn't know 
we're paying more in the past. You know, we have to look at it differently, maybe. But that's not up to us. That's up to those towns to get together and do that. And I'd say get done and get done quickly because it's just going to hurt the school district. And I think that's one of the reasons. I don't know what the Hanson folks think or whatever, afraid or whatever. That's something I was under that we were doing statutory all along. So it's no brainer. It's like, all right, it's good now. And then when it was brought up to us, no, we were doing methodology. Um, you know, it's, it's something that everybody, you know, going all the way back, selectmen, FinComs, ourselves, nobody was on the right page until that was brought up probably 18 months ago to two years. All right, I, I'm, I'm done. Next. Mr. Boyce, Mr. Small, then Mr. Scriven, and we've got to move this conversation. We're all saying the same thing. Mr. Boyce. Nice to Mr. Jones. I didn't mean to lash out at him, and that's in all sincerity. I appreciate Mr. Howard saying um, a 50-50. You know, we did talk about compromises, but it was out of our hands. I think Dan was just alluding to that and a few others. Um, that it, it has to be decided amongst the towns. I, I don't know where those conversations just don't go. I, you know, I, I, I don't. I, um, I agree with Ali that we just need to move on doing a budget. But Chris, thank you for adding that piece because, you know, my mind gets a little frustrated if, you know, our vice chair's now changed his mind from what he said a few months ago. But maybe this is part of the reason. And if you hear those pieces like, you know, maybe a 50-50. I, I always thought it would be some sort of segue. Um, I know what we voted back in June of 2018. I agree with what everyone else is saying, what, what we voted. We were under the impression that we were doing the statutory Don and, and, and Don and others, obviously. But, you know, if I don't hear something like from a Chris Howard that there's there, there might have been mention of a 50-50 or something to get through this first year. But then again, it's it's the other town leaders is kind of where that's at. Will they decide that? Will they agree to that? I was always told when I was on the in FinCom, Dr. McEwen would come to me, he goes, you can't be colluding with the town of Hanson. Well, you, you kind of have to collude right now. And I don't mean that in a bad way, that term, but you kind of have to get hand in hand with each other because you, you, you're not, you know, it, yeah, they're decide, one town's deciding one, one town's deciding for another, but you got to have a little bit of communication. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Small and Mr. Scriven. And not to try and beat a dead horse. So I just want to try and say two quick things. One is I don't believe it's in our purview to be able to negotiate the deal. That has to come from the selectmen and the FinComs. Those are the folks that have to strike a deal. It's our purview to get a budget done. B, the one question I would have for everyone in Hanson and our Hanson committee members, are you better off financially and within a structure paying the additional monies on statutory method? Do you still come out ahead better than if you had your own school district? And I think the answer is you come out still very much ahead by being a region, part of a region, even paying the statutory numbers. Uh, and that's all I have to say. Mr. Scriven. Uh, this, my question actually, maybe John Tuffy could, could answer this. Um, John, could you explain to me how the SPED stabilization accounts work? Are they funded within the budget or like, how is that? So it's been a while since I've looked at the details, but my recollection is that it, it's, it's a separate appropriation from, from town meeting to put money into the stabilization fund or the school committee can designate money would go into a stabilization fund. And that has to be the first dollar that comes in on an assessment and it's set, set aside on just like the town has a stabilization fund and it's a restricted purpose it can only be used for sped expenses and there's a laundry list of what they of what it covers and i believe it is therapies trans transportation and out of district placements doesn't cover for instance um, class teachers is my recollection i'd have to look up the details um, and it and it sits there 
until it is till it is tapped until the school committee votes to use it because of an unusual circumstance it can't be used for any other purpose so the, is the is the structure of the funding um factored into the, the the our budget and how is it assessed to the town do you know what i mean is it is there a specific go ahead i think you it is it becomes part of your budget and a budget yep. line item yeah and it assessed to the towns in the normal way is my recollection thank you i'll look up the details and, and confirm it and get back to you thank you very much okay dawn anything is just to follow up to that question mr scriven had um can you just elaborate a little more on where that information is coming from chris or how you're you know coming up with that question um, how am i coming up with the question yeah i just haven't heard special ed stabilization fund mentioned before this entire year so i'm wondering what the nature of that question is i think well in discussions with you know um the different members of um selectmen and, and whatnot th there has been talk about taking certain line items in the budget and negotiating compromise that way Certain districts, okay. Don, have a SPED stabilization account. Certain regional school districts, we do not have a okay. SPED stabilization account. If, okay. If I could add, um, it's only been around for about the last five, six years. Um, it, can ha it can happen in a town that has its own school system or it ha can work for a regional school district as well. And if I think we all remember a couple of years ago, we had some surprising SPED expenses. And so the idea behind it was that you could um, ease out the ease out the bumps, if you will. And so every year you could add money to that account. And so the year that that you get unusual expenses, well, you've got a reserve to pay for it rather than um, having to try to figure out how you're going to come up with those with those with those costs. Okay. I, I think part of my maybe to answer the question heard that today actually some right. of it came up today in the regional amendment committee and to set set the record a little bit straight Don it hasn't always been our alley it hasn't always been frustrating you voted against it once Don you voted against it once because you wanted the four teachers in it it was seven three three seven I voted with so-called against the Hanson members once. I'm voting against this because I think we're gonna have more information by Friday. We have a, a scheduled meeting next week. I know we need a number, but I'm just explaining my position and explaining that this hasn't always been uh, a six four vote. This was a seven three vote a couple of times with people from Whitman voting again with people from Hanson, with, you know, it's been back and forth. It's been good banter and there's been plenty of information and there's certainly been people changing their vote, including myself. So I just thought that I want that to be, I have voted the other way. If we call it another way, there's, there's no win in this. This isn't really a game. This is an informational thing of, we're trying to do the best that we can in this 10 of us. And 55 million, whether it's 55,320,000 or 37, they're very, very big numbers. It's a $2 million increase. And it's uh, not an increase because if we want it to be, it's like your house, things go up. And it's difficult and it's unsustainable as I've heard in the past. And we have to get by this. There's no question. And as I said, I read to you earlier, it came right from Christine Lynch that on Friday is going to be some decisions made. And I voted against it because I believe Friday could make a big change. And the same thing that happened with the methodology that we're talking about. So is there anything new to be brought before this committee before I enter? Michelle, don't we have a meeting for the 29th already? I don't have anything posted yet. But you can have one, sure. That one's not we, on your calendar. We, we meet weekly now. Um, 
<laughs> right. We what? I know that. We, we, we meet weekly now uh, instead of monthly. So I Is just it a pencil standing it in. Invitation? Yeah. It's a stand, you know, seven o'clock here. Next, next week, we're going to have somewhere. chicken wings. <laughs> Hey Bob, I just I have a question to clarify. It's is it two thirds or majority to pass the budget? It's two thirds, right? Yes. Two thirds. So there needs to be seven votes, Allie. Seven right, out so of didn't 10. we have a seven three at one point? Illegally. Oh yeah. yes. I so, think it's at the full committee. Right? It's it has to two be thirds of a full committee. It has to be seven, seven out of ten. Seven affirmative votes, regardless of the number on the that are present, right? Yeah, but if you only right. had eight people and you have an affirmative, the motion would carry. Right. Correct. Exactly. Okay, so we are going to have a meeting next Wednesday night. Does anyone have an issue with that? No. I've got places to be, you know. <laughs> Yeah, behind the computer <laughs> on Zoom. Fred, you must be freezing. You're still in the park and the sun's down. <laughs> I'm in the backyard. Chair yeah. Mays, motion to adjourn. Second. Someone, second. someone want to second that? Second. Who seconded it? Mr. Boyce. Hey, Boyce. Okay, Mr. Boyce. Yes. Dawn. Yes. Dan. Yes. Chris. Yes. Mike Jones. Yes. Rob O'Brien absent. Chris. Yes. Driven, I'm sorry. Fred Small. No. I, I mean, yes. <laughs> Allie <laughs> Taylor. Yes. Bob Hayes, yes. Unanimous vote, 9 0. Good night, everyone. Thank you. All right. Good night. I have no idea how to hang.